you have your Bibles, like you turn to Matthew chapter 23, you will be looking at uh, a metaphor Jesus used, talking about a mother's care and applying it to himself and his concern for his people. Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39, we read these words. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I had longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A um, teacher decided to teach her students about magnets, and um, so she showed them what magnets can do and how they could pick up iron shavings and other things uh, that uh, would be attracted to a magnet. And uh, the next day, she gave her third graders a little quiz, and she said, write a six-letter word that describes something that picks things up. And of course the answer was magnet. Uh, but 50% of the class wrote down mother. Right. right? They knew what mother does. A mother's care, a mother's concern, a mother's uh, love for each and every one of us. Now, as we always begin a Mother's Day uh, sermon like this, we always have to remember that some families uh, were not uh, traditional families. Some Children grew up without mothers, like the young lady we saw uh, in the video a few moments ago. And others uh, had mothers that uh, may have had substance abuse problems and other difficulties, or maybe they uh, just were not around a lot. And so uh, for the, those children, motherhood may not seem to be a, a very special thing. And so we understand that. But uh, t this morning we're talking about an ideal of, of who mother is. And and many of us grew up in not perfect homes, but we did have uh, homes that had a mother that cared and, and showed uh, kindness to us and, and did things for us and helped us to grow up to become adults. And so as we look at this passage today, we want to realize that, that Jesus was completing a week of teaching at the temple uh, during the season of Passover. He was very close to the time in which he would have the Last Supper and then of course, be crucified, and uh, he closes out in this chapter 23, where he is uh, speaking to uh, the people and saying, look, um, don't be like your religious leaders. They're blind guides. He said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to become a servant and serve others. And then he lists a whole bunch of woes. Woe to you, Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes. Woe to you. And he gives a whole list of things these scribes and Pharisees had done that were contrary to the way God wanted his leaders to lead the people. And so as a result of that, Jesus uh, looks at uh, the nation of Israel. He looks at the people there in the city of Jerusalem. He looks at those who are at the temple, and, and he knows that his time is short. And so he had constantly ple pleaded with his people to repent and accept the good news of the kingdom. But Israel had refused. Remember, he sent his disciples out, two by two. And they went out and they preached all over Israel. And they came back all excited because God had done many miracles. But the nation refused to repent, Amen. even though God had done a wonderful work among them. And so as he leaves the city, Jesus looks out over Jerusalem and he laments over the coming judgment. He knows that uh, in a few short years, 40 years, uh, the temple would be destroyed, the city would be destroyed, the people of Israel scattered around the globe by the Romans. He knew the judgment that was coming. And, and so he uses this metaphor of a mother hen and her chicks to describe his great love and his deep longing for his wayward people. He wants them to know how much he cares for them and loves them, but like a mother looking after a wayward child, he knows that bad things are coming. And in, in, in describing this, this way, Jesus lets us know that God cares for us like a mother cares for her children. Amen. 
And, and if you had a good experience with your mother, you know what kind of pure, devoted love that is. And if you had not had that kind of experience, just be sure that, that God can show you motherly love that you never experienced Amen. before. Because God cares for us like a mother cares for her children. Amen. So let's look at this passage and, and, and see how Jesus carries this metaphor a little bit further. It's not a full-fledged parable, but it is a good analogy of God's love for us. First of all, a mother loves her children. A mother loves her children. A mother uh, is one who, who does so many things for her child and expresses that in so many ways. There was a minister's wife that told of filling out a form in her pediatrician's office, and beside the mark, uh, blank marked occupation were these words. If you devote the greater part of your time to loving, caring, and making a home for your family, put a big star in this space. Okay, That's what mothers do isn't it? They devote their time to loving, caring, and making a home for your family. As I was looking at Facebook this morning, somebody had posted a, a cartoon picture, and uh, the words were, uh, Mom, we've hired some people to um, uh, allow you time off on Mother's Day so you can relax. And it showed six people standing there. One was a chef, one was a cleaning up crew, and the other, you know, on and on, a doctor and a nurse and so on. Amen. That's all the things mothers do Amen. because they love their children Amen. and they care for them. But, but notice what, what Jesus uh, did here when he uh, looked at that city, Jerusalem. Jesus repeatedly called his people to repentance and to acceptance of the kingdom of God. Now the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they only tell of a couple times Jesus went to Jerusalem, but John has more than that. And from the statement Jesus makes here, we, we get the picture that he had made many visits to Jerusalem. And he had spoken many times to the people to repent and turn to God. And, and notice what he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together. Amen. Now anytime in the scripture when, when a word is repeated two or three times, that means this is very important. This is very important. And Jesus is saying, Jerusalem, I love you. Jerusalem, I love you. Please listen to me. Please listen to me. And yet, they did not. You see, Jesus had this great longing and love for his people. Now, Brooks Ramsey is a, a, a pastor, a counselor uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And he said that he was uh, studying the Old Testament and he made a great discovery. He said in the Hebrew language in the Old Testament, the word for compassion comes from the root worm word womb. And the picture is of birthing. Birthing. Something new is being born. So if you apply that to human experience, it means that any compassionate act always gives the other person another chance, a new birth, a new opportunity. I don't hold past failures against them. I offer a fresh start. I want this for myself and from others. Am I willing to give it to another person, he says. And such compassion will dramatically change the way we relate to each other. And, and that's the root worm, it, the word that comes from womb. And that's the way a mother is, isn't it? Yeah. That she's the one who shows compassion and care and love for her children. She's always willing to give them a fresh start. Amen. She's always willing to pick them up. And uh, as Noah says, I've got an owie. And she's always willing to kiss the owie and say, okay, son, go on again. Amen. That's a mother's love. And Jesus had that same kind of love for his people. And he wanted them, despite their resistance, despite their rebellion, he wanted them to come back to him and come back to God. You see, there's a reason for that. That is that, that God loves us and wants the best for us. God loves us and wants the best for us. You know, we repeat this verse over and over, but can we fully understand it? That for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, Amen. eternal life. 
Do you hear that? God loves us. God loved the world so much. He gave his one and only son. He gave us the best. He cared for us uh, just like a mother cares for a child and wants the best for her child. That's the way God cares for us. The little girl in the video we saw from the children's home said her story had been rewritten. How had it been rewritten? It was rewritten because now someone told her, I love you. You're not just a throwaway. You're not just someone who needs to be shuffled underfoot. You're precious. You're beautiful. And I care for you. And that's the way God looks at you and me. So how do you feel right now? Are you saying yes, yes, that's right? Or are you saying, I'm not sure that God loves me like that? How much more could he give you to express that love? He gave his very best. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to have everlasting life. He wants you to be part of his family. God loves us and wants the best for us. And so we get from this picture Jesus is painting that God loves us like a mother loves her children. That's how much God loves us and cares for us. But but notice also as we look at this picture of a a mother and her chicks that a mother protects her children. A mother protects her children. She watches out for them. She cares for them and, and is there to defend them from all kinds of problems. Elian Jones uh, writes this, I ask you, who was greater, Thomas A. Edison or his mother? When he was a young lad, his teacher sent him home with a note which said, your child is dumb. We can't do anything for him. Mrs. Edison wrote back, you do not understand my boy. I will teach him myself. And she did with the results that are well known. Only a mom could defend a child like that. Amen. Only a mom had enough concern and care and insight into her child to devote her life to make him the very best. Amen. And here we see her protection for her child, Thomas Edison. And what a wonderful story his life was as he invented many things. You see, a mother protects her children. A mother cares for her children and, and protects her children. And and Jesus compares his care for us to a mother hen defending her children. Notice what he says. Jesus says, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Now, do you notice, as we saw that little video earlier, when the dog came up to the mother hen, what happened to the chicks? They ran under the mother's wings, didn't they? They wanted protection. They wanted to make sure they weren't going to have to face that dog on their own. And so the result was mama was looking out for them. And and Jesus says, that's my care for you. I am protecting you just like a mother hen protects her chicks. And and so we need to thank God for that and, and, and just praise him that he cares for us just that way. Now, You may be wondering to yourself, uh, how is it we can compare God to a mother? You know, isn't that sacrilege? There are some people that uh, would be very upset by that thought. And yet, what's, what's the Bible tell us? The Bible says God is a spirit. God is a spirit, right? Those that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. And so God is neither male nor female. Now, how, how do you uh, speak about God? Jesus said when you pray, say, Our Father. So, so many of us have prayed with using the male sense. But there are images throughout the Bible that talk about God in the sense of a maternal sense, of, of being a mother. And this maternal image of God sheltering his people under his wings is very common in the Bible. And I listed several references there that you can look up. Uh, he talks about being sheltered under eagle's wings and, and uh, under the wings of uh, a dove, under the wings of a, a uh, hen. 
uh, the idea is that God uh, spreads his wings of protection over us, just like a mother bird would protect her children, her chicks. And so we look here at Psalm 91.4 as an example. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. A maternal love that God gives to each and every one of us and shows his great love and protection and care for us. We can hide under the shadow of his wings, not being fearful anymore because we know we're protected by Almighty God. Amen. We're protected by that mother that cares for her offspring. Now, years ago, um, there's stories told about a mother that was going across South Wales in the hills, and um, she had a little baby in her arms, and suddenly out of the blue came this blinding blizzard, and, and uh, she kept trying to reach her destination, got lost, and, and uh, she had to try to take shelter the best she could. And after the storm had passed, the searchers went out looking for her, and they found her beneath a mound of snow. And what they discovered there was quite astonishing because uh, before she had died, she had taken off all her clothes and wrapped them all around her baby. And when they unwrapped the child, to their surprise and joy, they found that he was alive and well. Amen. And she had mounted her body over his and given her life for her child, proving the depths of her mother's love, just like a, a mother hen would provide the shelter with the wings covering those little chicks. Amen. And the rest of the story is that years later, that child, David Lloyd George, grew to manhood and became prime minister of Great Britain, one of England's greatest states, Amen. all because a mother protected her child. And that's what God does for us. He protects us and watches over us and cares for us. Just like a mother defends her young, God shelters us from all harm. Amen? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. God cares for you and for me. But, but you see, there's also this side of motherhood that we don't often mention. That only a mother knows. Probably even more than the father. A mother has a great desire to see their children succeed. To, to make sure their child stays on the right path. To make sure their child grows into adulthood and, yes. and succeeds and is successful to carry on their own life and their own family. And when that doesn't happen, when the child gets off track, when the child goes astray, a mother grieves for that child. Yes. No one grieves for another like a mother grieves for her wayward children. And Jesus brings that out in this passage here. You, you see, God's people, especially the religious leaders of Jesus' day, had a history of rebellion and rejection of God's ways. Yes. Jesus lists a few of those a few verses back from what we've just read this morning. And he talks about how they killed the prophets and they beat them and, and, and they rejected them and, and so on. He talks about how the prophets that God sent to his people were rejected and turned away. And so Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. You were not willing. And so he grieves for his people who beat up the very people that could have helped them. Amen. The prophets that could have given them the straight and narrow way. Yes. And yet they beat them up. They killed them. They stoned them. Amen. And Jesus said, I long for you to turn from that path, but you were not willing. And you can hear the grief. You can hear the sorrow. Because he wanted his children he wanted his nation to be in right relationship with God, and yet they continued to rebel against God. Only a mother can grieve that way. And so what happens is Jesus warns the nation that judgment is coming because of their persistent rebellion. <coughs> Did you catch what he says here? He says, look, your house is left to you desolate. What's that mean? It's deserted. There's not going to be anything left to it. It's left to you desolate. Why? I tell you, you'll not see me again until you say, Blessed is he 
who comes in the name of the Lord. They had rejected their Lord. They had rejected their king. And as a result of that, their house was left to them desolate. Amen. They had all the rules. They had all the scripture. They had all the history. They had all the wonderful religious leaders of the past. But they continually rebelled against God and rejected his offer of love and care for them. So Jesus says, okay, the judgment is coming. I just have to give you up and let you go on your own. And, and many a parent have had to look and say to their children, I've done everything I can for you. And yet you continue to rebel. You continue to go your own way. All I can do is pray for you and let you know I love you. But you're on your own. Whatever happens, the consequences are yours. And so Jesus allowed them to go on. He says, one day I'll return. And you'll see me then. But until that time, you're on your own to face whatever may come. And of course they did. They faced that coming judgment when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was torn down and the Romans crushed the Jewish people. And so Jesus warns them, judgment is coming because you've rebelled so much. And, and like a mother who longs for her child to turn away from the wrong path, God does not want anyone to face certain punishment. You know, God doesn't want that. Just like a mother doesn't want that for her child, God doesn't want that for you and for me. And yet, and yet God allows us to be ourselves. How much more love can be shown that way? To, to allow you to be you, to make your own choices, right or wrong. He doesn't force you to do anything. He doesn't force you to choose his path. He, he doesn't manipulate you in such a way that you can't help yourself. You have to follow him. He'll do everything he can to woo you and bring you to himself, but he's not going to force you. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens unto me, I will come in and have fellowship with him. But notice he knocks. He knocks. You've got to decide if you're going to answer the door. You've got to decide if you're going to open that door up and let him in. He can't force himself in. He, he's not like the, uh, the police force that has those big ramming rods and forces the door down. Uh -uh. He knocks. He's a gentleman. Are you going to let me in? All right. I'll come back again, maybe. Maybe. So what are you doing? Are you opening the door? Notice what the Bible says in 2 Peter. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. How much more can he say it? You don't know when your time will come. You don't know when the Lord will return. You don't know when your day is the final day you'll take a breath. Amen. Just like my friend I told you about last week, 54, died of a heart attack without any history of heart problems. You don't know when that day is yours. Right. You don't know how long you can let him knock without answering that door. Amen. You don't know. We don't know if t this afternoon Jesus will say, that's enough, had enough of ISIS, had enough of earthquakes, had enough of destruction, had enough of rebellion, had enough of sex trafficking. This is it. I'm coming back. Amen. You don't know when that's going to happen. Amen. It could happen at any moment. Yes. Time is not on your side. Right. That's why the Bible says now is the day of salvation. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. Yes. A, a woman was telling a preacher one day, I just don't know if I'm, I'm ready for that. Uh, I'm not sure you know, when I'll be ready to give my life to Jesus. And he said, if I could, if I could uh, show you a scripture that tells you exactly when you need to give your life to Jesus, would you do that? She says, really? There's a scripture like that? And he says, yeah. And so he opened it up to 2 Corinthians, and it says, Behold, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. That's the only time you got right now. 
So what are you going to do with that time? Are you going to give your life to Jesus? Are you going to accept God's love and care for you? Are you going to let him protect you and shelter you from the storm? Are you going to give your life to him and allow him to be the Lord and master and king of your life? Today's the day of salvation. Now's the time when you need to do that. You see, God provides a way for us to return to him and restore the broken relationship. He he provides a way for that to happen. He gives us the way in which we can follow him. Notice what Hebrews 9 says. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. You see, here, here's what the Bible's telling us there in the book of Hebrews. He's saying, Jesus has done everything he needs to do. God has given you every opportunity you can have. He he provided his son who became a sacrifice for you. And he took your sins upon himself. And he died upon the cross. And he shed his blood to cover your sins. And he raised him from the grave. And so if you believe in him right now, you'll have salvation. It's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. You only got one chance here, one opportunity. What are you going to do with it? You see, because he says, if you delay, he's coming again. But when he comes a second time, it won't be so you can receive salvation, no. It'll be to collect those who've already been saved. It'll be to bring his family home. But those that have rejected him, they don't get a second opportunity. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And so what are you going to do with this opportunity God has given to you, this provision that God has given to you? Are you going to give your life to him? Are you going to follow him? Are you going to allow him to be the Lord of your life? You see, a mother's love is so strong that a mother will always believe the best for her children. And God's the same way with us. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's why it says he's allowing it to go on. He's allowing it to go on. He's delaying the time when he comes again. He's he's delaying that moment. Why? Because he loves you and he cares for you. He wants the best for you. He wants you to reach out to him right now while you have the opportunity. Remember the Unabomber? Uh, This was kind of an interesting thing. Stephen Mathewson uh, was pastor uh, out there in Montana at the time. And uh, he said it was the first church he'd served. And so he would go to the uh, public library in the edge of town to study. And he said he always saw the same group of four or five scruffy-looking guys wearing dirty coats and long beards. And he said they looked like mountain men. And they probably were. But they would come out of the hills to study who knows what. He said, I see these guys there with stacks of books and sitting in cubicles. And he said, I didn't think much about it at the time. But about four years later, after I left that church, I found out that one of these guys was Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. He says, if you know anything about Kaczynski's story, you know he grew up a gifted young man. He became a math professor, but was disillusioned, so he moved to the mountains of Montana. And sometimes he'd come down from the mountains to mail bombs to people he didn't like. And after years of investigation, he was finally discovered by police and sent to prison. But here's where the story gets even more interesting. A while ago, his mother, Wanda Kaczynski, was interviewed by a reporter with the Chicago Tribune. She made some statements that were very powerful. At this time, the article was written. She had been writing monthly letters to her son in prison. She shared with a reporter what she had written in her most recent letter. She wrote, I want you to know, Ted, that when a child is born, The parents give them the gift of unconditional love for a lifetime. This is true of you, no matter what happens. My love for you will be there for a lifetime. Love, mother. Even after he'd refused to look at her when he entered the courtroom during his trial, even after he had given testimony in court that described her as a horrible person, she still loved him enough to write those monthly letters. And while we look at that, example of human love we we think 
of God's love for us. In Romans chapter 5, it says that God has done something very incredible. The Bible says that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrated his love for us so much that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In 1 John 4.10, John writes, This is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's God's love for us. It goes even beyond Ted Kaczynski's mother's love for him. God wants the best for you. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants you to experience his family joy. And the only one who can make the decision to join that is you. He's done everything he needs to do. And he's provided a way for you to return to him and restore that broken relationship. You see, just like a mother will lay down her life to keep her children safe, so too did Jesus sacrifice his life to bring us back to the family of God. So God cares for us like a mother cares for her children. Thank God. Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, there's some here today that say, yeah, I, know, I know all about mama's love and I love my mama and I appreciate all she did for me. But maybe they've never thought in terms that you, the God of heaven, love them as much as a mother loves a child. That you showed that love, you demonstrated that love by sending your son to die for us to give his life for us, to be the sacrifice for us, to be the one who provides the way to become part of your family. And so, Lord, if there's one here today that's never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, may this be the day they just bow humbly and and pray a prayer something like this. Oh, God, I've been going my way instead of your way. I want to be part of your family now. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, God, for raising him from the dead. Thank you for forgiving my sins and making me part of your family. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Make me a child of God. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed a prayer like that this morning, we want to invite you to come, share that with us, and say, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I I want to be a child of God. I want to be part of his family from now and forever. Won't you do that this morning? This is your opportunity. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Do it today as we stand together and say, you come.